427, Chapter 36 of The Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 1108. Welcome to Craplet, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 427, Up and Adam. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? Oh, I have had so much stuff going on since last I spoke with you. I did jump on to a crafty chat with Erica last week, just because I missed everyone. But we are back to our crafty schedule. And uh, we may be on a slightly abbreviated schedule from that point out as well. But I'll know more the closer we get to that date. But we had a lovely time. We went up to 1000 Islands in northern New York. It's right on the border of Canada. We went to Kingston in Canada. I had my passport confiscated because I had used the wrong passport, which is a little tense. But I came home and found the correct passport, so all is well for going to Paris. And I will also be going to Brussels. If you are in or around the Brussels area, I will be there October, I think it's 9th. And I am not there for long. I kind of fly in, teach a course, and fly back out again. But if you're in the greater Brussels area, let me know, because it is possible that I will be able to have dinner or breakfast or something. I'm really not sure what my flights are like yet, but I will soon. And then uh, and then I can make some plans. So the kids have started school. Things are good. Uh, thing one is now a junior in a high school, which was my favorite year to teach. So I'm having a lot of fun. And thing two is in seventh grade now and taller than his aunt and his grandmother. So that's still kind of shocking. But the boys are very happy and doing well, and that, of course, makes me happy as well. You may have noticed that Thing 2 has started his own website. He has a comic that is up on the site, and he has a YouTube channel, and he has an animation that is up on the site. And he is working on several different series ideas, some comic, some animated, and some just scripted right now. But he is just a constantly churning mass of creativity. And it is so much fun to watch this happen. And he's really excited too, which, which is just great. He's having fun and, and doing his own thing. And that, that makes me very, very happy. We got several voicemails while I was on hiatus and vacation. And so I'm going to play those for you. But first I have a voicemail from Rochelle who just cracked me up with her enthusiasm and also really inspired me with the awesome connection she makes between the topic at hand and literature. Here you go. Hey, Heather, it's me. I'm the clay lady. And I am so happy that it works for you. I'm so happy that it works for us. And I'm just glad that it is giving you some relief. So, excuse me, I'm walking up the hill. I think it's really fun that this is a literary podcast and that the whole reason I had the idea to put clay on my bites, on my kids' bites, is because of great literature, because of the little up in the prairie books when Laura's cousin Charlie stops on a yellow jacket nest and Ma and the ants all wrap them up in mud, put mud all over them and wrap them up and put them to bed. Anyway, it was because of that that I even had the thought to put clay on bites. So, great literature affects us in so many different ways. So, I'm at the top of the hill now. <laughs> but I just had to say that because I love your podcast and I love how literature affects us and I just think it's awesome. So, that's it. Okay, clay lady, signing out. Bye. So, yes, I actually remember that 
moment in the Little House, Little House on the Prairie, was it, I think? It was Little House on the Prairie. I remember that vividly because Mm -hmm. that scene is what made me terrified of getting stung by any stinging beastie uh, at a relatively young age. And, uh, And when I did finally get stung, I didn't have any mud or clay on hand. Now I do. But our next voicemail comes from Lee's, and this refers back to episode 423, so a little while ago. Hi, Heather. This is Lee, listening to 423, to the comments at the end, and I had to stop and call you and disagree vehemently. I just heard what you said about Octavia Butler and reading Kindred, and I would agree. Read anything and everything by Octavia Butler right away. You won't regret it. But I have to object to how you compared Octavia Butler to Ray Bradbury and the form of science fiction. Ray Bradbury doesn't write about science fiction stuff. It's definitely maybe not character-driven, but theme-driven. And he does characters very, very well. And he's a fantasist. He is not a hard science fiction writer. I think Asimov is a hard science fiction writer. But I defy you to give me one Ray Bradbury story where the science is the point of the story. He has written a lot of amazing things, and they are classified as science fiction, but they are not about the science. They are fantasy stories which have science in them, and they are very much about the themes first, and the characters second, and the science third or fourth of it. And read everything he wrote, too. But um, thank you for another great episode, and I will look forward to hearing you next week. Well, Lise is absolutely right. I am so, so glad she called in to correct me on that one, because that's a big mistake to make. I know that Bradbury's books are usually classified as science fiction because they exist in a science fiction-y-like environment most of the time. Dandelion Wine doesn't, but The Martian Chronicles does. And I knew better. And what I should have said was Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov, but I didn't. So, Lise, thank you very much for calling in and correcting me on that one. It is an important distinction to make outside of the world of science fiction, but also within it. And doing more of the worlds with H.G. Wells, it's a good time to be making that distinction. So thank you. We did manage to get together for a crafty chat this week, so here we go with a little bit, a little taste of our crafty chattiness from Tuesday afternoon's live stream over on YouTube. one thirty Eastern. It's easy to watch. Go to youtube.com slash C, just the little letter C, slash craftlit dash channel. Here's what we had to say. Crafty stuff. It's been so long since we've all been here at the same time. Dawn, what have you been up to lately? Actually, not a lot because it was kind of crunch season in the youth soccer world. <laughs> um, but I did do some Olympic knitting. Ooh. With some of my hands on, which was fun. Yay! And made... Woo! Okay. And then, this is cable mittens. Oh, cute. And these were the um, Navajo ply mm-hmm. that I tried for the Tour de Fleece earlier in the summer. Mm-hmm. Um, it just, it turned out, this was Cordale, and it was a really grabby Cordale. So I don't think it was a really great yarn choice. For that because it didn't slide on itself very easily. Right. Um, but it made some nice mitts. Hey, we I like think. mitts. And in Minnesota, mitts are good. Yes. Because we, we lose them all winter long. I thought that was just me. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, Minnesota so is full of my children's lost mittens. <laughs> <laughs> That's where they are. <laughs> yeah. So I have, and none of these projects are on Ravelry yet, so I'll have to get them added so people can see the, so both of the hats, the patterns just came out of my head, but the mittens are actually somebody's pattern. How cute. Yeah. I like those. Those are really subtle. Yeah. They, this was, um, some Briar Rose Fibers top and it's very, they're a lot, st- they turned out really stripey, um, subtly stripey. Yeah. But it did, it did exactly what I wanted it to do with her fiber. And it preserved the subtle stripes that she dyes into it. Right. Because when I when I tend to like two ply it or three ply it traditionally, the colors all merge and get kind of muddy and much more uniform, which is fine. 
but um, it kind of loses her dye technique. There's a hat, too. Ooh. Oh, and this one is for my kiddo who has the really big head. <laughs> <laughs> so it's huge on me. But his head is enormous. But this is what I wanted to ask you about. So, you know, it's just a tube and then cinched at the top. Right. But I can't get the hole to close. Oh, I've never no. had this problem before. You know, usually you just, like, put the thread through all the, you know, put the tail through all the stitches and then you just cinch it closed. Yeah. It won't cinch all the way closed. It's like there's too many stitches to cinch it all the way closed. Can you go back and do any more decreases around to make them fewer? Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to have to do. It's the only thing I can think of. <laughs> Aside from, you know, putting a puff ball on the top of it and calling it done. I know, a big pom- a huge pom pom. <laughs> if I hadn't used all the yarn, I would do that, but I used all the yarn. All righty. So, our chapter today. Today we have chapter 36. We have gone through all the drama of the pre-carnival fet celebration. I don't know how you would refer to really grisly executions, but uh, we're past that now, right? Which puts our characters in a, an interesting psychological position at the beginning of chapter 36. And you're going to watch a really big character emotional arc happen over the course of this chapter. It's a long chapter and it's an interesting chapter. And it's kind of funny because when I started doing the prep work, when I was first going over this chapter again, I thought, oh, there's going to be nothing to talk about, blah, blah, blah. But you know, you live with these things for long enough and stuff starts to pop out. There are several things that may be confusing to you if you don't have references to the terminology or to the people that they're talking about. Dumas does some interesting fancy footwork in this chapter. So a couple of things just to keep in mind as we listen. Dragues are little like candied almonds, like those Jordan's almonds um, that you can get in the States. That's one. There is an engraver and painter, last name Calot, C-A-L-L-O-T. You will hear a reference to the carnival people looking like something out of one of his engravings. And I've linked to one of them from the show notes. You've probably seen it, but didn't realize that that's what you were looking at. His characters, he does all the Commedia dell'arte characters in their Commedia costumes, which are very much like carnival costumes. And he manages to capture in his engravings both the, the reality of the costume, but he couples that with this kind of mythical fantasy look as well. I don't know how he's doing it. It's really pretty neat to to spend some time looking at his work, but I, I included one one of the pictures for you in the show notes today. Astarte is one of the many, many variations on a goddess of love that uh, lived around in and around the Mediterranean. You have Ishtar, you have Aphrodite, you also have Astarte. So she's mentioned as being beautiful and a love goddess as a metaphor. A domino, a domino costume is not going dressed up as a tile with dots on it, but it does have something to do with the way that a domino tile is divided. If you stood it up on end, like you were going to you know, knock them all over and turn it into some kind of a pattern going. Um, if you were to do that, when you stood it up on end, you'd see that there's dots on the top and dots on the bottom. And there's usually some kind of a white line or a dividing line in between the two halves. That's where the domino comes from. Because a domino, when you're talking about a costume, is usually a cloaked costume. So you have a hood over your head and a half mask on. Not not entirely like Phantom of the Opera Broadway version, but covering your eyes and your the bridge of your nose. And I think it's pretty commonplace to think, oh, Venetian carnival mask is those half masks. And that would be correct. So someone who is dressed as a domino, you can see their mouth and chin and jawline and pretty much nothing else. So that's that. You'll hear a Reference to a contadine, 
or Contadina. Those are peasants, uh, male and female. Nestor, Ulysses, and Circe. These come in quick succession. Uh, Nestor was one of the wisest people in the Iliad and the Odyssey, but he also gets made fun of a little bit because he's he's a little Polonius-like. He kind of goes on a bit. So there is some humor injected in our sentence today because of how he is often perceived by the other characters in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Then you have Ulysses, who is very wise, very careful, very cautious. In fact, so cautious and careful that it takes him 10 years to get home. So there's another little tiny bit of humor in that one. And then there's Circe, and she was one of the women who Ulysses came into contact with. Some call her a witch, some call her a nymph, some call her a goddess. Whatever it is, she has magical powers and she can change humans into other things like animals. And perhaps my favorite, towards the end of the chapter, you will hear a reference to the way that Carnival removes barriers in society. So you have a poor guy who's walking with, talking with, dealing with, touching Uh, a rich guy who is touching nobility, who is this. But they're using Italian terms for this. One of the terms that we have not heard yet is facino, which would be a grifter or a con man or a pickpocket. So you'll hear it starts with facino. So that is kind of fun. And that's it. That's where I'm stopping. Let's listen to chapter 36 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 36. The Carnival at Rome. When Franz recovered his senses, he saw Albert drinking a glass of water, of which to judge from his pallor he stood in great need, and the Count, who was assuming his masquerade costume. He glanced mechanically towards the square. The scene was wholly changed. Scaffold, executioners, victims, all had disappeared. Only the people remained full of noise and excitement. The bell of Monte Cittorio, which only sounds on the Pope's decease, and the opening of the carnival, was ringing a joyous peal. "'Well,' asked he of the Count, "'what has then happened?' "'Nothing,' replied the Count. "'Only, as you see, the carnival has commenced. Make haste and dress yourself.' "'In fact,' said Franz, "'this horrible scene has passed away like a dream.' "'It is but a dream.' "'A nightmare that has disturbed you. "'Yes, that I have suffered. "'But the culprit? "'This is a dream also. "'Only he has remained asleep while you have awakened, "'and who knows which of you is the most fortunate. "'But Peppino, what has become of him? "'Peppino is a lad of sense, "'who, unlike most men, "'who are happy in proportion as they are noticed,' was delighted to see that the general attention was directed towards his companion. He profited by this distraction to slip away among the crowd, without even thanking the worthy priests who accompanied him. Decidedly, man is an ungrateful and egotistical animal. But dress yourself. See, Monsieur de Morcerf sets you the example." Albert was drawing on the satin pantaloon over his black trousers and varnished boots. "'Well, Albert,' said Franz, "'do you feel much inclined to join the revels? "'Come, answer frankly.' "'Ma foi, no,' returned Albert, "'but I am really glad to have seen such a sight. "'And I understand what the Count said, "'that when you have once habituated yourself to a similar spectacle, "'It is the only one that causes you any emotion. "'Without reflecting that this is the only moment "'in which you can study character,' said the Count, "'on the steps of the scaffold death tears off the mask "'that has been worn through life, "'and the real visage is disclosed. "'It must be allowed that Andrea was not very handsome, "'the hideous scoundrel. "'Come, dress yourselves, gentlemen, dress yourselves.' Franz felt it would be ridiculous not to follow his two companions' example. He assumed his costume and fastened on the mask that scarcely equalled the pallor of his own face. Their toilet finished, they descended. The carriage awaited them at the door, filled with sweetmeats and bouquets. 
they fell into the line of carriages. It is difficult to form an idea of the perfect change that had taken place. Instead of the spectacle of gloomy and silent death, the Piazza del Popolo presented a spectacle of gay and noisy mirth and revelry. A crowd of masks flowed in from all sides, emerging from the doors, descending from the windows. From every street and every corner drove carriages filled with clowns, harlequins, dominoes, mummers, pantomimists, transteverins, knights and peasants, screaming, fighting, gesticulating, throwing eggs filled with flour, confetti, nosegays, attacking with their sarcasms and their missiles, friends and foes, companions and strangers, indiscriminately, and no one took offence, or did anything but laugh. France and Albert were like men who, to drive away a violent sorrow, have recourse to wine, and who, as they drink and become intoxicated, feel a thick veil drawn between the past and the present. They saw, or rather continued to see, the image of what they had witnessed, but little by little the general vertigo seized them, and they felt themselves obliged to take part in the noise and confusion. A handful of confetti that came from a neighbouring carriage, and which, while it covered Morcerf and his two companions with dust, pricked his neck, and that portion of his face, uncovered by his mask like a hundred pins, incited him to join in the general combat in which all the masks around him were engaged. He rose in his turn, and seizing handfuls of confetti and sweetmeats, with which the carriage was filled, cast them with all the force and skill he was master of. The strife had fairly begun, and the recollection of what they had seen half an hour before was gradually effaced from the young men's minds. So much were they occupied by the gay and glittering procession they now beheld. As for the Count of Monte Cristo, he had never for an instant shown any appearance of having been moved. Imagine the large and splendid Corso, bordered from one end to the other with lofty palaces, with their balconies hung with carpets and their windows with flags. At these balconies are three hundred thousand spectators, Romans, Italians, strangers from all parts of the world, the united aristocracy of birth, wealth, and genius. Lovely women, yielding to the influence of the scene, bend over their balconies, or lean from their windows and shower down confetti, which are returned by bouquets. The air seems darkened with the falling confetti and flying flowers. In the streets the lively crowd is dressed in the most fantastic costumes. Gigantic cabbages walk gravely about. Buffaloes' heads bellow from men's shoulders. Dogs walk on their hind legs. In the midst of all this, a mask is lifted, and, as in Callot's and Temptation of St. Anthony, a lovely face is exhibited, which we would fain follow, but from which we are separated by troops of fiends. This will give a faint idea of the carnival at Rome. At second turn, the Count stopped the carriage and requested permission to withdraw, leaving the vehicle at their disposal. Franz looked up. They were opposite the Rospoli Palace. At the centre window, the one hung with white damask with a red cross, was a blue domino, beneath which Franz's imagination easily pictured the beautiful Greek of the Argentina. "'Gentlemen,' said the Count, springing out, "'when you are tired of being actors, and wish to become spectators of this scene, you know you have a place at my windows. In the meantime, dispose of my coachman, my carriage, and my servants.' We've forgotten to mention that the Count's coachman was attired in a bearskin, exactly resembling Audrey's in The Bear and the Pasha and the two footmen behind were dressed up as green monkeys with spring masks, with which they made grimaces at every one who passed. Franz thanked the Count for his attention. As for Albert, he was busily occupied throwing bouquets at a carriage full of Roman peasants that was passing near him. Unfortunately for him, the line of carriages moved on again, and while he descended the Piazza del Popolo, the other ascended towards the Palazzo di Venezia. "'Ah, oh, my dear fellow,' said he to France, "'he did not see.' "'What?' "'There, 
that calash filled with Roman peasants. No. Well, I am convinced they are all charming women. How unfortunate that you were masked, Albert, said Franz. Here was an opportunity of making up for past disappointments. Oh, replied he, half laughing, ha, I hope the carnival will not pass without some amends in one shape or another. But in spite of Albert's hope, the day passed unmarked by any incident, excepting two or three encounters with the carriage full of Roman peasants. At one of these encounters, accidentally or purposely, Albert's mask fell off. He instantly rose and cast the remainder of the bouquets into the carriage. Doubtless one of the charming females Albert had detected beneath their coquettish disguise was touched by his gallantry, for, as the carriage of the two friends passed her, she threw a bunch of violets. Albert sees it, and as France had no reason to suppose it was meant for him, he suffered Albert to retain it. Albert placed it in his buttonhole, and the carriage went triumphantly on. "'Well,' said Franz to him, "'there is the beginning of an adventure.' "'Laugh, if you please. "'I really think so. "'So I will not abandon this bouquet.' "'Pardieu,' returned Franz, laughing, "'in token of your ingratitude.' "'The jest, however, soon appeared to become earnest, "'for when Albert and Franz again encountered the carriage with the contadini, "'the one who had thrown the violets to Albert clapped her hands when she beheld them in his buttonhole. "'Bravo! Bravo!' said Franz. "'Things go wonderfully. Shall I leave you? Perhaps you should prefer being alone.' "'No,' replied he. "'I will not be caught like a fool at a first disclosure by a rendezvous under the clock, as they say at the opera balls. If the fair peasant wishes to carry matters any further, we shall find her.' "'Or rather, she will find us to-morrow. "'Then she will give me some sign or other, "'and I shall know what I have to do.' "'On my word,' said Franz, "'you are wise as Nestor, and prudent as Ulysses, "'and your fair Circe must be very skilful or very powerful "'if she succeed in changing you into a beast of any kind.' "'Albert was right.' The fair unknown had resolved, doubtless, to carry the intrigue no farther, for although the young men made several more turns, they did not again see the calash, which had turned up one of the neighbouring streets. Then they returned to the Rospoli Palace. But the Count and the Blue Domino had also disappeared. The two windows, hung with yellow damask, were still occupied by the persons whom the Count had invited. At this moment, the same bell that had proclaimed the beginning of the mascherata sounded the retreat. The file on the corso broke the line, and in a second all the carriages had disappeared. Franz and Albert were opposite the Via della Marata. The coachman, without saying a word, drove up, passed along the Piazza di Spagni and the Rospoli Palace, and stopped at the door of the hotel. Signor Pastrini came to the door to receive his guests. Franz hastened to inquire after the Count, and to express regret that he had not returned in sufficient time. But Pastrini reassured him by saying that the Count of Monte Cristo had ordered a second carriage for himself, and that it had gone at four o'clock to fetch him from the Rospoli Palace. The Count had, moreover, charged him to offer the two friends the key of his box at the Argentina. Franz questioned Albert as to his intentions, but Albert had great projects to put into execution before going to the theatre, and instead of making any answer, he inquired if Signor Pastrini could procure him a tailor. "'A tailor,' said the host, "'and for what?' "'To make us, between now and uh, to-morrow, two Roman peasant costumes,' returned Albert. The host shook his head. "'To make you two costumes between now and to-morrow,' "'I ask your Excellency's pardon, but this is quite a French demand. "'For the next week you will not find a single tailor "'who would content to sew six buttons on a waistcoat "'if you paid him a crown a piece for each button.' "'Then I must give up the idea?' "'No, we have them ready made. "'Leave all to me, and to-morrow, when you awake, "'you shall find a collection of costumes with which you will be satisfied.' "'My dear Albert,' said Franz. 
leave all to our host he has already proved himself full of resources let us dine quietly and afterwards go and see the algerian captive agreed returned albert but remember signor pastrini that both my friend and myself attached the greatest importance to having to-morrow the costumes we have asked for the host again assured them they might rely on him and that their wishes should be attended to upon which france and albert mounted to their apartments and proceeded to disencumber themselves of their costumes albert as he took off his dress carefully preserved the bunch of violets it was his token reserved for the morrow the two friends sat down to table but they could not refrain from remarking the difference between the count of monte cristo's table and that of signor pastrini truth compelled franz in spite of the dislike he seemed to have taken to the count to confess that the advantage was not on pastrini's side during dessert the servant inquired at what time they wished for the carriage albert and franz looked at each other fearing really to abuse the count's kindness the servant understood them his excellency the count of monte cristo had he said given positive orders that the carriage was to remain at their lordship's orders all day and they could therefore dispose of it without fear of indiscretion they resolved to profit by the count's courtesy and ordered the horses to be harnessed while they substituted evening dress for that which they had on and which was somewhat the worse for the numerous combats they had sustained this precaution taken they went to the theatre and installed themselves in the count's box during the first act the countess g entered her first look was at the box where she had seen the count the previous evening so that she perceived france and albert in the place of the very person concerning whom she had expressed so strange an opinion to france her opera glass was so fixedly directed towards them that france saw it would be cruel not to satisfy her curiosity and availing himself of one of the privileges of the spectators of the italian theatres who use their boxes to hold receptions the two friends went to pay their respects to the countess scarcely had they entered when she motioned to france to assume the seat of honour albert in his turn sat behind well said she hardly giving france time to sit down it seems that you have nothing better to do than to make the acquaintance of this new lord ruthven and you are already the best friends in the world without being so far advanced as that my dear countess returned franz i cannot deny that we have abused his good nature all day all day yes this morning we breakfasted with him we rode in his carriage all day and now we have taken possession of his box you know him then yes and no how so it is a longer story tell it to me it would frighten you too much so much the more reason at least wait until the story has a conclusion very well i prefer complete histories but tell me how you made his acquaintance did any one introduce you to him no it was he who introduced himself to us when last night after we left you through what a medium the very prosaic one of our landlord he is staying then at the hotel de londres with you not only in the same hotel but on the same floor what is his name for of course you know the count of monte cristo that is not a family name no it is the name of the island he has purchased and he is a count a tuscan count well we must put up with that said the countess who was herself from one of the oldest venetian families what sort of man is he ask the vicomte de morcerf you hear monsieur de morcerf i am referred to you said the countess we should be very hard to please madame returned albert did we not uh, think him delightful 
A friend of ten years' standing could not have done more for us, or with a more perfect courtesy. Come, observed the countess, smiling. I see my vampire is only some millionaire who has taken the appearance of Lara in order to avoid being confounded with Monsieur de Rothschild, and you have seen her. Her? The beautiful Greek of yesterday. No, we heard, I think, the sound of her guzzler, but she remained perfectly invisible. When you say invisible, interrupted Albert, it is only to keep up the mystery, for whom do you take the blue domino at the window with the white curtains? Where was this a window with white hangings? asked the countess. At the Rospoli Palace. The count had three windows at the Rospoli Palace? Yes. Did you pass through the Corso? Yes. Well, did you notice two windows hung with yellow damask, and one with white damask with a red cross? Those were the Count's windows. Why, he must be a nabob. Do you know of what those three windows were worth? Two or three hundred Roman crowns? Two or three a thousand? The deuce! Does his island produce him such a revenue? It does not bring him a bayoko. Then why did he purchase it? For a whim. He is an original, then. In reality, observed Albert, he seemed to be uh, somewhat eccentric. Were he at Paris and a frequenter of the theatres, I should say he was a poor devil literally mad. This morning he made two or three exits worthy of Didier or Antony. At this moment a fresh visitor entered, and, according to custom, France gave up his seat to him. This circumstance had, moreover, the effect of changing the conversation— an hour afterwards the two friends returned to their hotel. Signor Pastrini had already set about procuring their disguises for the morrow, and he assured them that they would be perfectly satisfied. The next morning, at nine o'clock, he entered France's room, followed by a tailor, who had eight or ten Roman peasant costumes on his arm. They selected two exactly alike, and charged the tailor to sew on each of their hats about twenty yards of ribbon, and to procure them two of the long silk sashes of different colours with which the lower orders decorate themselves on fete days. Albert was impatient to see how he looked in his new dress, a jacket and breeches of blue velvet, silk stockings with clocks, shoes with buckles, and a silk waistcoat. This picturesque attire set him off to great advantage, and when he had bound the scarf around his waist, and when his hat placed coquettishly on one side, let fall on his shoulders a stream of ribbons, France was forced to confess that costume has much to do with the physical superiority we accord to certain nations. The Turks used to be so picturesque with their long and flowing robes, but are they now not hideous with their blue frocks buttoned up to the chin, and their red caps which make them look like a bottle of wine with a red seal? France complimented Albert, who looked at himself in the glass with an unequivocal smile of satisfaction. They were thus engaged when the Count of Monte Cristo entered. Gentlemen, said he, although a companion is agreeable, perfect freedom is sometimes still more agreeable. I come to say that today, and for the remainder of the carnival, I leave the carriage entirely at your disposal. The host will tell you I have three or four more so that you will not inconvenience me in any way. Make use of it, I pray, for your pleasure or your business. The young men wished to decline, but they could find no good reason for refusing an offer which was so agreeable to them. The Count of Monte Cristo remained a quarter of an hour with them, conversing on all subjects with the greatest ease. He was, as we have already said, perfectly well acquainted with the literature of all countries. A glance at the walls of his salon proved to France and Albert that he was a connoisseur of pictures. A few words he let fall showed them that he was no stranger to the sciences, and he seemed much occupied with chemistry. The two friends did not venture to return the account the breakfast he had given them. It would have been too absurd to offer him in exchange for his excellent table, the very inferior one of Signor Pastrini. They told him so, frankly— 
and he received their excuses with the air of a man who appreciated their delicacy. Albert was charmed with the Count's manners, and he was only prevented from recognizing him for a perfect gentleman by reason of his varied knowledge. The permission to do what he liked with the carriage pleased him above all, for the fair peasants had appeared in a most elegant carriage the preceding evening, and Albert was not sorry to be upon an equal footing with them. At half-past one they descended. The coachman and footman had put on their livery over their disguises, which gave them a more ridiculous appearance than ever, and which gained them the applause of France and Albert. Albert had fastened the faded bunch of violets to his buttonhole. At the first sound of the bell they hastened into the Corso by the Via Vittoria. At the second turn a bunch of fresh violets, thrown from a carriage filled with harlequins, indicated to Albert that, like himself and his friend, the peasants had changed their costume also. And whether it was the result of chance, or whether a similar feeling had possessed them both, while he had changed his costume, they had assumed his. Albert placed the fresh bouquet in his buttonhole, but he kept the faded one in his hand, and when he again met the calash, he raised it to his lips, an action which seemed greatly to amuse not only the fair lady who had thrown it, but her joyous companions also. The day was as gay as the preceding one, perhaps even more animated and noisy. The Count appeared for an instant at his window, but when they again passed, he had disappeared. It is almost needless to say that the flirtation between Albert and the fair peasant continued all day. In the evening, on his return, Franz found a letter from the embassy, informing him that he would have the honour of being received by His Holiness the next day. At each previous visit he had made to Rome, he had solicited and obtained the same favour, and incited as much by a religious feeling as by gratitude, he was unwilling to quit the capital of the Christian world without laying his respectful homage at the feet of one of St. Peter's successors, who had set the rare example of all virtues. He did not then think of the Carnival, for in spite of his condescension and touching kindness, one cannot incline one's self without awe before the venerable and noble old man called Gregory XVI. On his return from the Vatican, France carefully avoided the Corso. He brought away with him a treasure of pious thoughts, to which the mad gaiety of the maskers would have been profanation. At ten minutes past five, Albert entered overjoyed. The harlequin had reassumed her peasant's costume, and as she passed she raised her mask. She was charming. France congratulated Albert, who received his congratulations with the air of a man conscious that they are merited. He had recognized by certain unmistakable signs that his fair incognita belonged to the aristocracy. He had made up his mind to write to her the next day. France remarked, while he gave these details, that Albert seemed to have something to ask of him, but that he was unwilling to ask it. He insisted upon it, declaring beforehand that he was willing to make any sacrifice the other wished. Albert let himself be pressed, just as long as friendship required, and then avowed to France that he would do him a great favour by allowing him to occupy the carriage alone the next day. Albert attributed to France's absence the extreme kindness of the fair present in raising her mask. France was not sufficiently egotistical to stop Albert in the middle of an adventure that promised to prove so agreeable to his curiosity and so flattering to his vanity. He felt assured that the perfect indiscretion of his friend would duly inform him of all that happened, and as during three years that he had travelled all over Italy a similar piece of good fortune had never fallen to his share, France was by no means sorry to learn how to act on such an occasion. He therefore promised Albert that he would content himself the morrow with witnessing the Carnival from the windows of the Rospoli Palace. The next morning he saw Albert pass and repass, holding an enormous bouquet, which he doubtless meant to make the bearer of his amorous epistle. This belief was changed into certainty when France saw the bouquet, conspicuous by a circle of white camellias, in the hand of a charming harlequin, dressed in rose-coloured satin. The evening was no longer joy, but delirium. 
Albert nothing doubted but that the fair unknown would reply in the same manner. Franz anticipated his wishes by saying that the noise fatigued him, and that he should pass the next day in writing and looking over his journal. Albert was not deceived, for the next evening Franz saw him enter triumphantly, shaking a folded paper which he held by one corner. Well, said he, was I mistaken? She has answered you, cried Franz. Read. This word was pronounced in a manner impossible to describe. Franz took the letter and read. Tuesday evening, at seven o'clock, descend from your carriage opposite the Via dei Pontifici, and follow the Roman peasant who snatches your torch from you. When you arrive at the first step of the church of San Giacomo, be sure to fasten a knot of rose-coloured ribbons to the shoulder of your harlequin costume, in order that you may be recognised. Until then, you will not see me. Constancy and discretion. Well, asked he when France had finished, what do you think of that? I think that the adventure is assuming a very agreeable appearance. I think so also, replied Albert, and I very much fear you will go alone to the Duke of Bracciano's ball. France and Albert had received that morning an invitation from the celebrated Roman banker. Take care, Albert, said France. All the nobility of Rome will be present, and if your fair incognita belong to the higher class of society, she must go there. Whether she goes there or not, my opinion is still the same, returned Albert. You have read the letter? Yes. You know I'm perfectly the women of the Mezzocito are educated in Italy. This is the name of the lower class. Yes. Well, read the letter again. Look at the writing and find if you can any blemish in the language or orthography. The writer was in reality charming, and the orthography irreproachable. You are born to good fortune, said France, as he returned the letter. Laugh as much as you will, replied Albert. I, I mean love. You allow me, cried France. I see that I shall not only go alone to the Duke of Bracciano's, but also return to Florence alone. "'If my unknown be as amiable as she is beautiful,' said Albert, "'I shall fix myself at Rome for six weeks at least. "'I adore Rome, and I have always had a great taste for archaeology. "'Come, two or three more such adventures, "'and I do not despair of seeing you a member of the Academy.' "'Doubtless Albert was about to discuss seriously his right to the academic chair "'when they were informed that dinner was ready.' Albert's love had not taken away his appetite. He hastened with France to seat himself, free to recommence the discussion after dinner. After dinner the Count of Monte Cristo was announced. They had not seen him for two days. Signor Pastrini informed them that business had called him to Civita Vecchia. He had started the previous evening, and had only returned an hour since. He was charming, whether he kept a watch over himself or whether by accident he did not sound the acrimonious chords that in other circumstances had been touched he was to-night like everybody else the man was an enigma to france the count must feel sure that france recognized him and yet he had not let fall a single word indicating any previous acquaintance between them on his side, however great France's desire was to allude to their former interview, the fear of being disagreeable to the man who had loaded him and his friend with kindness prevented him from mentioning it. The Count had learned that the two friends had sent to secure a box at the Argentina Theatre, and were told they were all let. In consequence, he brought them the key of his own. At least, such was the apparent motive of his visit." France and Albert made some difficulty, alleging their fear of depriving him of it, but the Count replied that as he was going to the Pali Theatre, the box at the Argentina Theatre would be lost if they did not profit by it. This assurance determined the two friends to accept it. France had by degrees become accustomed to the Count's pallor, which had so forcibly struck him at their first meeting. He could not refrain from admiring the severe beauty of his features, the only defect, or rather the principal quality of which, was the pallor. Truly a Byronic hero. 
france could not we will not say see him but even think of him without imagining his stern head upon manfred's shoulders or beneath lara's helmet his forehead was marked with the line that indicates the constant presence of bitter thoughts he had the fiery eyes that seemed to penetrate to the very soul and the haughty and disdainful upper lip that gives to the words it utters a peculiar character that impresses them on the minds of those to whom they are addressed the count was no longer young he was at least forty and yet it was easy to understand that he was formed to rule the young men with whom he associated at present and to complete his resemblance with the fantastic heroes of the english poet the count seemed to have the power of fascination albert was constantly expatiating on their good fortune in meeting such a man france was less enthusiastic but the count exercised over him also the ascendancy a strong mind always acquires over a mind less domineering he thought several times of the project the count had of visiting paris and he had no doubt but that with his eccentric character his characteristic face and his colossal fortune he would produce a great effect there and yet he did not wish to be at paris when the count was there the evening passed as evenings mostly pass at italian theatres that is not in listening to the music but in paying visits and conversing the countess g wished to revive the subject of the count but france announced he had something far newer to tell her and in spite of albert's demonstrations of false modesty he informed the countess of the great event which had preoccupied them for the last three days as similar intrigues are not uncommon in italy if we may credit travellers the comtesse did not manifest the least incredulity but congratulated albert on his success they promised upon separating to meet at the duke of bracciano's ball to which all rome was invited the heroine of the bouquet kept her word she gave albert no sign of her existence the morrow or the day after at length tuesday came the last and most tumultuous day of the carnival on tuesday the theatres open at ten o'clock in the morning as lent begins after eight at night on tuesday all those who through want of money time or enthusiasm have not been to see the carnival before mingle in the gaiety and contribute to the noise and excitement from two o'clock till five france and albert followed in the fete exchanging handfuls of confetti with the other carriages and the pedestrians who crowded amongst the horses feet and the carriage wheels without a single accident a single dispute or a single fight the fetes are veritable pleasure days to the italians the author of this history who has resided five or six years in italy does not recollect to have ever seen a ceremony interrupted by one of these events so common in other countries albert was triumphant in his harlequin costume a knot of rose-coloured ribbons fell from his shoulder almost to the ground in order that there might be no confusion france wore his peasant's costume as the day advanced the tumult became greater there was not on the pavement in the carriages at the windows a single tongue that was silent a single arm that did not move it was a human storm made up of a thunder of cries and a hall of sweetmeats flowers eggs oranges and nosegays at three o'clock the sound of fireworks let off on the piazza del popolo and the piazza di venezia heard with difficulty amid the din and confusion announced that the races were about to begin the races like the moccoli are one of the episodes peculiar to the last days of the carnival at the sound of the fireworks the carriages instantly broke ranks and retired by the adjacent streets all these evolutions are executed with an inconceivable address and marvellous rapidity without the police interfering in the matter the pedestrians range themselves against the walls then the trampling of horses and the clashing of steel were heard a detachment of cabiniers fifteen abreast galloped up the corso in order to clear it for the barberi when the detachment arrived at the piazza di venezia a second volley of fireworks was discharged to announce that the street was clear almost instantly in the midst of a tremendous and general outcry seven or eight horses excited by the shouts of three hundred thousand spectators passed by like lightning then the castle of saint angelo 
fired three cannon to indicate that number three had won. Immediately, without any other signal, the carriages moved on, flowing on towards the Corso, down all the streets like torrents pent up for a while, while again flow into the parent river, and the immense stream again continued its course between its two granite banks. A new source of noise and movement was added to the crowd. The sellers of Moccoletti entered on the scene. The Moccoli, or Moccoletti, are candles which vary in size from the Pascal taper to the rushlight, and which give to each actor in the great final scene of the Carnival two very serious problems to grapple with. First, how to keep his own Moccoletto alight, and secondly, how to extinguish the Moccoletti of others. The Moccoletto is like life. Man has found but one means of transmitting it, and that one comes from God. But he has discovered a thousand means of taking it away, and the devil has somewhat aided him. The Moccoletto is kindled by approaching it to a light, but who can describe the thousand means of extinguishing the Moccoletto? The gigantic bellows, the monstrous extinguishers, the superhuman fans. Every one hastened to purchase Moccoletti, France and Albert among the rest. The night was rapidly approaching, and already at the cry of Moccoletti, repeated by the shrill voices of a thousand vendors, two or three stars began to burn among the crowd. It was a signal. At the end of ten minutes, fifty thousand lights glittered, descending from the Palazzo di Venezia to the Piazza del Popolo, and mounting from the Piazza del Popolo to the Palazzo di Venezia. It seemed like the fete of jack o' lanterns. It is impossible to form any idea of it without having seen it. Suppose that all the stars had descended from the sky and mingled in a wild dance on the face of the earth, the whole accompanied by cries that were never heard in any other part of the world. The facino follows the prince, the transteverin the citizen, every one blowing, extinguishing, relighting. Had old Aeolus appeared at this moment, he would have been proclaimed king of the Mocoli, and Aquilo the heir presumptive to the throne. This battle of folly and flame continued for two hours. The Corso was light as day. The features of the spectators on the third and fourth stories were visible. Every five minutes, Albert took out his watch. At length it pointed to seven. The two friends were in the Via del Pontifici. Albert sprang out, bearing his moccoletto in his hand. Two or three masks strove to knock his moccoletto out of his hand, but Albert, a first-rate pugilist, sent them rolling in the street, one after the other, and continued his course towards the church of San Giacomo. The steps were crowded with masks, who strove to snatch each other's torches. Franz followed Albert with his eyes and saw him mount the first step. Instantly, a mask wearing the well-known costume of a peasant woman snatched his moccoletto from him, without his offering any resistance. Franz was too far off to hear what they said, but without doubt nothing hostile passed, for he saw Albert disappear arm in arm with the peasant girl. He watched them pass through the crowd for some time, but at length he lost sight of them in the Via Macello. Suddenly the bell that gives the signal for the end of the carnival sounded, and at the same instant all the moccoletti were extinguished as if by enchantment. It seemed as though one immense blast of the wind had extinguished every one. Franz found himself in utter darkness. No sound was audible save that of the carriages that were carrying the maskers home. Nothing was visible save a few lights that burnt behind the windows. The carnival was over. End of chapter 36 you might catch a quick reference at the very end of the chapter to Manfred and Lara. And it's about a headdress that you could see on Manfred or Laura, Lara. You could envision the same thing on the Count of Monte Cristo. And this could be very confusing if you think that Lara is a woman, L-A-R-A. Uh, Manfred is an epic poem by Lord Byron, one of the many sources of the Byronic hero idiom. And Lara is another gentleman, he, Lord Lara. He is someone who had traveled 
in the Orient, as did Manfred, uh, traveled in the Orient, quote unquote Orient, and at least someplace like Algiers, where Byron went. And he comes back to England and then drama ensues. Both of these characters are classic Byronic heroes. And it is no accident that Franz makes this comparison. Our Count of Monte Cristo, if you haven't already gotten there yet, is classic Byronic hero. And at first you might think, well, that's kind of, you know, what's Dumas doing? He's just copycatting Byron. But he's not, because we're considerably after Byron at this point. What we are, however, is reading a book written by somebody who wrote popular fiction at the time, which means that just like Twilight had cell phone usage in it, whereas Stranger Things that was just released but took place in the 1980s didn't have cell phones, it's the same kind of thing you would expect if you read popular fiction today that you would see cell phone usage, you would see the internet, you would see a level of interconnectivity that we didn't have 10, 15, 20 years ago. Dumas was writing about things that were popular at the time, and popular at the time was still big R romantic stories, images. And I don't know that you can say that the Byronic hero ever really went out of style once it was identified and kind of codified by Byron. I mean, Rubble Without a Cause... Geez, I don't know, you know, pick one. Russell Crowe's Gladiator, brooding, all of that quiet, quiet, stolid. Although he had a wife and kids, so I don't know if the Gladiator would really fit. But there is no shortage of Byronic heroes out in popular media. And I'm sure that you are right now standing there saying, Heather, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, duh. And you're right. You're absolutely right. So that's the Byronic hero thing. So we have had our carnival. And now Albert is off with his woman, his lady love, and Franz has been left on his own in absolute darkness, which doesn't seem so great to me somehow. The way everything had been going and the fact that he's now on foot and it's completely dark when everybody blew out their candles, that's a little ominous. It's a little creepy. And that's a little Dumas because cliffhanger. So you're going to want to read the chapter that comes out next time. Very, very smart man. There were a couple of places in today's chapter where I wanted to tell you the stories behind them, but I wanted you to hear them first. One of those stories is there's a a line about whether someone was going to be like a Didier or an Aunt Antony. And this is because Didier was a character in a Victor Hugo play. And the play was put on at the same theater that all of Dumas' plays were put on. Antony was a character in a play that Dumas had written prior to Victor Hugo's play. Victor Hugo was accused of copying Dumas, and there was a small public outcry. And this is obviously early on in Victor Hugo's career. Dumas defended him publicly, saying, no, 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 this is completely different. He's He's got a completely different character, not copying. Go see the play. It's great. And both of those characters were Byronic heroes. But again, this is another one of those places where Dumas just kind of inserts reality, but also is inserting a reality where he looked pretty good. Just like he told us about the the story by Hoffman, the Sandman, the German writer who wrote The Sandman and several other Uh, very interesting books. And Dumas was the first French translator of Hoffman's work. So, you know, bringing it up, making you want to go read some, oh, you'll buy one of Dumas' books. Here, you hear about the plays, oh, you'll go see one of Dumas' plays. So you can compare it to Victor Hugo's. There's another place in here where he's talking about Carnival and what it's really like and what you can expect in Rome. And there is a line at the end of one of the paragraphs that the author has been there and seen it, and this is exactly what he has seen it to be. Period. It reminded me of something I read about uh, good books a long time ago. And this is good books in the grand classic literature sense, as well as in the beach reading, fun, easygoing, lightweight sense. And that is that great stories are also great travel guides. You're going to learn something about the place that your characters are in if the book is good. 
And I think we're getting our money's worth with the Count of Monte Cristo. We've been in Rome for a while now, and there's still a little bit more to go, so we'll see more. There was also the reference to Franz going and meeting with Pope Gregory the Sixteenth. Again, one of the reasons why this is in the book, and why Franz was so uh, positively impressed by Pope Gregory, is because Dumas was impressed with Pope Gregory. He was able to go to Rome. He was able to meet with the Pope. And uh, and he thought the guy was great. And they hit it off. So, <laughs> so Franz gets to do the same thing as a consequence. And there are, of course, references to the roads and the church and all of that where the girl had written the instructions for Albert, go to this church, step on this step, the person who comes up and talks to you and takes your light, that's that's going to be your girl, and she's going to take you somewhere special. So those are all real streets. The Via de Pontifici, that is right off of the Via del Corso, and the, the church is actually on the Via del Corso, heading towards the Piazza del Popolo, between the Palazzo Raspoli, where the Count's rooms are for overlooking Via del Corso, and the Piazza del Popolo, where all of the all of the drama took place before. So we have been in and around and localized right just to the west of Spania this whole time. And again, it's a travel log, which is very exciting and fun. And it's an opportunity for Dumas to show off where he's been and what he's done and who he's seen and what he's gotten to do. And I think that's great. He got to do some really interesting things. So I'm happy to read about it. And that's about it. I will talk to you soon. There's going to be an email going out to everyone with the schedule for the fall so that you know when to expect episodes. And, uh, and I'll put a link to that on the show notes as well so that you will not have to worry or wonder, wow, when's the next chapter coming out? It'll all be right there for you. Easy to access. And that's it. I hope you have a great week. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. If you like getting free audiobooks with benefits every week, please consider supporting the show over at patreon.com slash craftlet. There are rewards waiting for you beyond, you know, the free podcast. You can also subscribe to our premium streaming audio by tapping the red lock when you are looking at the app or at the show notes at craftlet.libsyn.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for a premium download subscription by following the links in the right-hand sidebar at craftlit.com. And if it's easier for you, you can always subscribe and review at iTunes and at Stitcher Radio. Like us on Facebook, support us at Patreon, and come with us on tour. For nine years, Craftlit has been kept going by the support of you, the listener. And for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on 